So our context was the bike and temperature question from last week. Uh, share, make a screen. So can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. So this is the same from um, the GitHub repo. And I will just talk about how I understood it. As I've been telling you that the deep, deep theory stuff about fires and distributions, I'm still getting it because I'm always trying to see, okay, in context, how does this apply to what I'm trying to write my paper on? And then this was asking about whether the model is fair. And then we're talking about all models are wrong, but they are useful because models are just an approximation. And then um, about questions to ask about biases, because as human beings, we are creating the models. So like whatever we think about the problem is going to be inherent in how we create our priors and how we, basically the priors, uh, I feel where we put a lot of the subjectivity in it so that and then it talks about the prior times the likelihood gives you the posterior. So your subjectiveness or your bias is, is really in to the posterior. So it asks you about, okay, just think about it conceptually. What will your results do? What would your, the implications of your research? And then thinking about your biases in, in context of the implications of your research. So, uh, Robert, what do you use base for? Or is all top secret corporate work? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> not at all. Not. We just have um, some metrics that like that relate to our sales. That relate to um, like we sell an LP product, right? To like government and commercial clients. Um, so we want to kind of get an idea of like estimating things, like what is like the sales cycle length for like different territories. Like what is like the percentage of, of uh, like opportunities we've won, right? Um, mm -hmm. Our problem is that we have like really small data. So like we have a small N, right? So if you want to like, you know, estimate, let's say- How small is small? Mm -hmm. um, less than a hundred, less mm -hmm. than a hundred. When we come, when we're coming to like territories, right? Um, when, when you like kind of split out everything, it's like less than a hundred observations. So if you mm -hmm. want to like estimate, let's say what our win rate is for this coming, you know, year, I mean, you could use last year's, right? Just like, here's the point estimate and here you are. Um, but obviously the problem with that is that it's like a small amount of data and it also doesn't incorporate other types of information. Like we've been hiring new people, um, you know, we, we've been trying to uh, incorporate like better processes to like, uh, you know, better our selling, right? So uh, what we had did, we had done, uh, this is a very, it just really is just an experiment is like, we asked like some senior people at, uh, you know, my company, like what were their priors for like these different metrics that are interested in. And it's like a really simple, like, model, right? This isn't like ooh, regression, right? We're not that we're going to be talking about today. It's literally just like, here's our observed data, right? Here are the priors. We combine all those priors. And then, uh, you know, we have like our posterior estimates. And one thing I've been like really trying to like focus on is that, yeah, we'll be using like essentially a point estimate and this like what's called this like planning model, which is trying to get like an idea of um, what you know, like how many opportunities do we think we'll create in the month for like this uh, mm -hmm. region of the business um, is like, yeah, I'll be like just deriving like a point estimate, but also like trying to also like show is that, yes, this is a point estimate, but we also now have this like range of like uh, plausible values, right? And there's also uncertainty, right? In that estimate mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that's kind of what at least I've been doing. Um, again, like super basic based, uh, like, you know, nothing yeah. like hierarchical regression or <laughs> nothing like that. And I think it's like at least a good starting point to like convince the business that this is something at least like more yeah. useful. I think from what this chapter was trying to tell us, okay, so just realizing that where your data is from, it might narrow what you get in your predictions, what it might tell you. So it's like, if your data is only on one territory or just one aspect of one territory, just making like being 
aware of these assumptions as you're going on. Um, yeah. Did you have any comments about um, ideas on biases and um, how that has affected you? I don't really know your real name, R.H. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, oh, me. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm, we're both R.H. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Ryan. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay, Ryan. Well, actually, yeah, we are both R.H. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah. I, uh, I, I, let me rename myself here, actually. <laughs> um, goodness. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so oh, Ryan, mm -hmm. did you have any i like as i know you've been doing this whole stats modeling for a while and they mm -hmm. gave the examples about uh, models being unfair and then models being used to like basically discriminate or like any ideas on where you've had to rethink on your biases and modeling or stuff like that yeah i mean <laughs> This whole idea of fairness, I mean, it's, um, it's funny, like, um, I, oh, I mean, like growing up, not as a Bayesian, but as a frequentist, you know, this is all sort mm -hmm. of se second, you know, learnings for me. Um, I don't really know how to respond to the, I mean, because I, yeah, I obviously read that, that, and, you know, we, um, you know, is it fair? We must always ask this question, even when the consideration is uneventful. How was the data collected? For whom was the data collected? What, what might? So, I mean, I, I wouldn't call that fairness. I would be like, is this representative data of the population? I mean, I would I would use different language, but yeah, I mean, I think certainly I've. I mean, anyone that's ever done. I mean, I work in medicine, so a lot of like you know, the data that we get is you know observational, which means you know it's like self-selected. There's a lot of missingness and stuff like that, and so it's not it's very unfair data you know what i mean and mm. so part of your job is as a frequentist at least is to try to you know to try to get a sense of okay how likely is this to have happened whatever you find based on you know chance alone um but um yeah i don't know i mean i i'm i'm with you like believe me like uh and, and i think robert was kind of saying something similar like you know in the early stages i've i've been to you know, I've been in a lot of classes over the last 20 years where there's like, it's about some kind of modeling and like there's like a one day where we talk about Bayesian stuff, you know what I mean? And it's like mm -hmm. sort of, it's, it's, it's almost like you, you do more damage than good by just having like a one day thing because it's, I'm like Robert, I'm like, what do you mean by, what, what, what is this prior stuff, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So um, yeah, anyway, I, I would say, um, yeah, no, the, there's, I, 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 there is a lot of stuff in, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to share in the, the Slack, but like, there is like, I mean, and I'm super not like expert about any of this, but there's all, there's a lot of like prior elicitation techniques. I don't know if you are familiar with this, like different ways, and maybe you've already talked about this, so maybe this is redundant, but let me actually find this right now. Um, that seems like a pretty, you know, like, I, actually, I'll give an example. Um, so I do a lot of psychometrics, right? So I don't know if either of you have ever done, like, factor analysis, you know? Have you ever Did in the class. In the class, Vaguely right? Vaguely remember. Yeah. Vaguely cool. remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think in some ways, there's a lot of, I mean, they're, they're very different in some, you know, there's actually, there is Bayesian factor analysis, too. So let's separate that as a separate thing. But you know, I would say factor analysis is a good analogy because there's all kinds of estimation. You can do estimation with principal axis factor. You can do multiple. You can do. Um, you know, you can do multiple like uh, maximum likelihood. You can do you know unweighted least squares. All these different things, and the choices that you make can have a pretty significant impact on what you find, right? Mm -hmm. So if I you know if I use a maximum likelihood you know estimation, am I and I'm I'm and there's like really problems with normality in my data, I've already done something that's going to like, it's, it's, it's like on par with like a prior, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where it's yeah. like, you know, I made an assumption about a technique that then bears fruit down the road when I try to, um, or I shouldn't say bears fruit, it has an impact on what that fruit is, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. um, you know, down the road. So I think, I don't know if this is, I mean, this is, you know, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm still... I'm just, I'm like, like you guys, I'm hanging on by a thread trying to understand this, but I would mm -hmm. say, um, you know, one of the things you, we do in psychometrics is you try a, a bunch of different things and be like, okay, well, if I'm finding a bunch of different 
answers when I use different estimation things, like which once again, I'm arguing would be kind of like setting priors or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You definitely want to um, just be more aware of mm -hmm. what, what those assumptions that you made and also like you know go into the literature like you know so like I go into the literature and be like okay this is what my data looks like I found x y and z paper that said okay in these situations in, and they're published mm -hmm. in, in reputable journals yeah. and they have reputable protocols for how they would you know do things and and so that's in, in some sense probably the closest I could say in my own work right now I will say like I work in I do a lot I work for um Oracle Health, and so um, we, one of the, I work on a pre patient preference team, and so one of the things we do is we give um, people like a series of hypothetical choices. Maybe they're asking about taking a certain medication or a certain surgery, and we say, okay, would you rather have this or this? And so one is like, you know, has a bunch of different attributes that we kind of list out, right? And then the, <laughs> the other one has something else, and so you do that a bunch of those, and then you use what's called hierarchical Bayesian models to estimate mm -hmm. the, the utility of the various attributes that are in those descriptors that I mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so like one drug, you only take it once, it lasts for six months, There's these are the side effects. It's, you know, this there's, there's some other negative or positive things. So they're all different attributes, different mm -hmm. levels of attributes. And so, yeah, I mean, Bay, you know, there's a lot of, cause you use MCMC to estimate those utilities, right? So, um, it's funny, actually, um, we've been doing all those, what are those, uh, Robert, what are those things called? Um, trace plots. Trace plots, sorry. I, I just, <laughs> yeah. I call it, you yeah. did this, I'm like, oh, I know what he means. I forget the names, so sometimes I refer to them as the squiggle plots. Um, but uh, yeah, we actually get those, like I use this program called Sawtooth, which is like a, it's a proprietary software that does but basically discrete, discrete choice analysis and yeah they have those those things and i've actually mm -hmm. been trying to learn how to do it in in stan right because that's you know would be the ultimate would be not having to work with like a gooey type analysis but anyway i'm rambling mm -hmm. at this point but to answer, <laughs> no i yeah to I, answer, yeah. I think, yeah good go on ryan yeah no i was just gonna say um i think what makes this approach better is i mean you know there's we, we never get away from subjectivity right i mean like i mean mm -hmm. we, i think the, the mistake is to think of frequentists as, oh well, we're just you know testing hypotheses we're, we're <laughs> these uninterested you know, observers just trying to figure out if you know we're, we we found something that's you know based on more than just chance you know or likely to be more than just chance um yeah and i think in some ways the subjectivity ends up giving you more, um, it's a little bit like pool, you know what I mean? Like when you shoot a pool ball on it and by accident, a bunch of things go, happen, right? Well, we're now we're saying, mm -hmm. okay, well, this is what we expected. We didn't see this, right? Mm -hmm. So either we go back to the drawing board or, you know, or we try something else, right? And as long as, yeah. the, as, long as the reader who is knowledgeable has some kind of basis for, <sighs> hopefully understanding what you did and why you did it they can agree or disagree that's as, that's as much as you can hope from scientific literature as far as i'm concerned yeah you know what i mean yeah. like we never we never mm -hmm. get to there's there's no answers there's just evidence in support of 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 um one thing or another and so i would just say like that's maybe that's what they mean by fairness to bring it all back to the book right? yeah I, I i agree with you that fairness is not the most appropriate word because it's not fair in that we are all being subjective, but with what you said, that as, as scientists, making sure our work is reproducible, documenting our assumptions, that would help us when we are going back or when someone is going back. So I guess um, this, the rest of this part was, our question was on, we used the normal distribution. So we're checking whether we follow the assumptions of independence, linearity, and normality. And um, here, it was going deep in to check about the model we created in earlier chapter. The binomial model, what do you mean? Um, we created a normal model. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. Um, this is actually 
the person here is actually, she's going to show the model that we created here. This is what we used for our model, this side. And then here, they just get a subset of the data bikes. And then they go through checking these two assumptions of linearity and normality. And I think the, the main focus of this chapter two was doing the PP check. So yeah, posterior to, protective check. Yes. So it was refreshing our mind so that we can get to that side. And when we, so this is our base model, and then we get one set of intercepts and, and sigma. We use that to do, to check our simulated rights against our observed rights. And then, uh oh, it went, yeah. So we use that to check and then we get this graph. Mm. So, so this graph was trying to, it was saying that, I think then we go to, let me just jump to where we have the 50 of them. So first we just use one set of the intercepts and then the other beta one, beta two. And now we use 50 of them to draw it to compare to our observed. So our observed was in the deep blue. And it's, they were able to, with the spread of the data, like the spread of the data in our observed and then our simulated data is okay. We're saying that with our base model, if we were to go back and try and simulate data sets that would have created this, base model, we get the same thing. So that's how I understood it. Am I on right? I mean, I think, I think, yeah, it's just, that's as, that's as good as the getting is, is going to get, I think, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, those like lines are like plausible. Mm -hmm. right like all those lines represent right like plausible parameters and it's like here's like the plausible data generating uh you know distribution right process for like these set of parameters and like you could obviously see that it's like pretty good i guess like our sample is a bit has like some it's not totally has like you know it's, it's bimodal um it's a mm -hmm. bit you know not not as normally distributed but like it does like a pretty good job right of capturing like the spread and like i would say probably like the mean as well mm -hmm. of the uh of the you know the capital bike share data <laughs> right yeah. yeah no so then the book goes into detail about if you had um a situation where this was not the same you might have to use a different data structure like maybe not use like in creating your posterior, not use normal distribution, because that's what we used here. Yeah? You might have to do a log transformation or something to change your data structure. I also think what's good about this too is that the like the previous chapters, right? We were talking about is my like mark off my is my MCMC, is it like correct in the sense of like is are the chains mixing fast is there like autocorrelation like does the posterior like you know look right right it's like there's like those um just like i would say like model specific checks and it's like okay good and then when you get to this this is like okay now that i have a posterior and i think my chains like look good right again there's no like uh apparent issues in them does the actual posterior that i create more or less resemble right the sample of data and then if it doesn't right that then gets to like things of like okay what were my choice of priors those seem to have been you know maybe like wrong right and i guess in this case it seems that our priors are like pretty good right um which i think is like another good check as well right where it's like and kind of i guess why i kind of also like phase two it's like there's just these all these different ways of showing clearly like documenting right like here we do have a model right but here's like 
the uncertainty we have, right? And we can like visually show that um, like with this and to actually see like, yeah, it kind of resembles our sample of data that we're working with. Okay, so I, I had a question because we are going to end up at the cross validation part. Mm -hmm. I had, so in, when we are creating this, we use the whole of these data bikes, don't we? But then in cross validation, it's saying that, okay, just take some parts of your data and then do the leave one out part of it. So it's like, we've already trained our model on the whole data. So mm -hmm. like, I don't, why are we, so isn't our model, like it's in cross validation, you are taking some part of it, doing a training set and then a, mm -hmm. a testing set. But then here, this bike model, already has all our data so right, I don't know, I was a little when, bit when you, confused when, when you do cross validation I, I haven't done it much other than like school exercise I don't use it in my own work but I definitely yeah. have used, I've used definitely used bootstrapping I mean they're all kind of the same thing which is we only have the data that we have and so what we try to do when we cross validate or we do bootstrapping or whatever is resampling with with replacement to create like a bunch of other little samples and see how stable our estimates are right so it's not really about I mean we've already used all of we've already used all of the data to come up with these estimates right so the idea is is when we chop up the data in a bunch of different ways and check again to see you know are we getting wildly different answers in all of the various checks right I mean at least that's that's, that's how I would think about bootstrapping is like when you have bootstrapped confidence intervals what you're saying is is hey man we've checked these against a bunch of different like different you know samples of within the sample does that make sense and so it's like it, it gives you a sense of okay this is um you know a way to just you know kind of see how stable your estimates would be i guess would be that yeah, would be, I guess. Yeah, and I think also at least my understanding. Same thing with you, Ryan. It's like I don't really use cross validation besides you know those like ML classes and whatnot, right? But I think my understanding too about this is um, so right, like cross validation gets you like what was it called in ML terms, the out of sample error, right? We we want to estimate that because we're using like this model for prediction purposes. Um, we want to kind of like get an idea of right, like how bad is our model, and then I think it's we then end up once we get an idea of that, right, with a cross-validation, right, we have, like, some portion of the data is our training data, and then we estimate, you know, with our test set, right, one set of that, we then use that as a testing set, estimate the statistics, and then, you know, compute the average of all the, you know, the K folds or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think it's that what you do the next, after you get, like, an idea of that, let's say everything looks, you know, more or less fine, is that then you train it on the full set of data, right? Because then when you actually like, deploy that model in like a production setting, you obviously want more data because more data, you know, mm -hmm. generally, right, is good. You know, obviously assuming mm -hmm. data is good. <laughs> but I think that's also like why we're training it right on like the full data set as well, even like after the cross-validation bet. Okay, so now I'm starting with my own data sets. I'm trying to do this and it's going to be a binomial thing. There's only two. Oh, are, are, are you, are you really, you really have data? You're talking about for real. You're like, you have real yes. data. Oh, wow. What's I, the data? I, what is it yeah. about? Can you, I mean, I don't know. Can you yeah. share? Okay. So I'm trying to keep time because we have a lot of interesting things to do. But well, no, don't, don't, don't worry about it. This is more fun than. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So I keep in mind what um, Richard always says, like, like, I'm not an um, expert in you. My expertise is in health. I, I did a master's of public health. But this is a situation that is happening in Ghana now. Um, we are, like everyone, COVID and like inflation is like very bad. Mm. But like it all came into a head August 12th to August 19th. The Ghana CD is tanking against the dollar if you are like speculating <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like really tanking against the dollar within just from like january to august now we've lost like 50 percent of our value of our money yeah so like at first it was one ghana cd to to one dollar to six ghana cds and now it's like one dollar to ten ghana cds right and then 
Like yeah. everything came ahead in 12th to 19th of August. Like then the currency was like going, hey, why everybody was looking to change their money for dollars? Because like that is the most stable way to go. So what I want to do is use data from Twitter to understand what people were feeling, what people were thinking. Oh, yeah. So I, I scraped tweets which contain the word CD, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so that's my main data set. And then I'm going to use binomial to like, <laughs> well, I'm still thinking about how I'm going to do it, but it's basically um, if this tweet contains, um, so it's like the A, B, like A, like, you know, they write P, then A, then dash B, right? So B is like the condition, right? Mm -hmm. So my condition is given that a tweet contains the word CD, does it also contain my list of bad words like depreciation, failing currency? Like, so I have a lot of list of bad words. So let's just say like um, a tweet, given that the tweet contains CD, does it also contain like depreciation? Yeah, so it's like the probability of like these bad words given co-occurring. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the probability of that a tweet, given that the tweet contains the word CD, does it also contain yeah. these bad words? Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, like, I will probably first start with just one bad word, depreciation, and then, like, see how I can add this other bad words. I'm not really sure how to do that yet yeah, maybe like I, after I so I have my data set of all the words that contain CD then I'm going to filter to see how many of them contain depreciation and then do not contain depreciation and then I don't know if I should go with the depreciation one to how many of them contain another like bad word like I don't know how exactly I'll do it but I'm, I'm still thinking maybe like um sorry this is i'm all fired up now this is like this is really this is really cool yeah um i think the first thing is instead of i mean maybe instead of trying to define those bad words maybe you should do some like um i just found something hold on let me put it in the chat um mm -hmm. there's like all kinds of cool stuff um like I mean, on I, sentiment analysis oh yeah yeah twitter sentiment analysis is like a big deal these days like a lot of people are doing like you know over covid that was like a big deal you know what i mean mm -hmm. so um because you know there's all kinds of oh what are people tweeting about what are people you know what are they mm -hmm. you know saying hold on I'm, I, I um yeah here's the chat okay so yeah this is a cool paper okay um so hopefully did that get did that come through uh yes it came through yeah so um I don't know, some of these are really techy, uh, you know, um, like you're using like NLP and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's also, this is in Python, but um, uh, so that tweets related to new government consist of neutral sentiment. So like, yeah, they're, so they're, I guess what they're doing is they're uh, classifying based on this naive Bayes method, which is sort of like beyond what we're doing. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, man, that's interesting. Yeah, let me yeah. Uh, let me think about. Um... <sighs> so I, yeah. I'm using that to to learn base to do this test my hands on it. But what I was thinking about with the so if I'm going to end up using cross validation, should I train my model just on like split my data like right ahead and split it eighty twenty and then just train my data yeah. on the twenty. You probably also want to do a uh, weighted, right? Because if like, well, actually, now I'm trying to think. I guess it depends on, you just want to see if it just contains one of those words, right? Yes. And you don't really care what word it is, just has to be one It, it just them. has to be in my, my list of bad words. Like, Got it. Yeah. And like eventually it's going to be hierarchical because like the tweets which are on one day I feel would be correlated because like everything was building up 
so one day might be a lot of tweets, bad day tweets, like, so, and then also some people tweet multiple times. So there's some level of hierarchical data in it. So that's where I am. So I guess the answer to the question is I should separate my data 70, 30 or 80, 20 to start with. Yeah. And then yeah, train, like it, all, it. it all depends also on like how much data you have as well, right? So like even like it's just a rule of thumb. So let's say you have like a million tweets, even if you've mm -hmm. used like a test set of like 10% is actually like mm -hmm. pretty good because you write, you have a hundred thousand examples uh, mm -hmm. too. So it's, it, it all depends, right? And the size of the data, like, yeah, people will give like the rule of thumb though of like 70, 30, but it like, I think like with everything in statistics, it's like, it depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, if I, if I think, if I find anything, like, cause I'm always searching literature for a variety of things that this is beyond my area of, um, of yeah, I, I just but. feel like it will be a, a cool thing to, to use to just see what is going on because it's like we are feeling it and people are expressing themselves on it so it's just basically i i don't like from thinking about it's my, my data bias yes it's only twitter users but i just want to see that it's a way to to see what is going on yeah. and then like for historical purposes like it's microblogging if you wanted to know what was happening at that time, like, yeah. So yeah, it seemed cool to do. No, I think it's a very cool project. And it's, how, what's, what size is your data? I mean, so you scraped it, right? Like, yeah. So I only have um, 4,500. So it's not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so, not a so, lot. So how, um, oh, by the way, I found a bunch of other like cool things that I'm just dropping in the chat. I don't know. Maybe these are all things okay. you've already seen, but I don't know. I have No, uh, thank uh, you. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me think about that more. Um, but uh, that is, yeah, that is interesting. So um, hmm, okay. Yeah. Let me, um, Trying to think okay. because so so basically so basically what you're trying to do is 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 note the co-occurrence of the 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 currency and name and some negative term or something like that. No, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I still think um, there's probably ways to use like naive Bayes to actually let it figure out what the negative terms are, I think, mm. right? Because I, I know naive base is like a big, big in ML. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So but that I, might be, not, that might be another whole other, that might be a whole other project. Um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. If you want to continue. Sorry. I, that's, that's super cool though. I'm really, yeah, that's interesting. Right. I need to think about it. So I guess, we were still thinking about this graph and there's lots more in the book, but the person who made this slide summarized this into like, if your data doesn't follow that, you should try and um, make a transformation or check your priors, what distribution you use in the beginning, like go back to the beginning, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And then it talked in the book, it gave, this like there was this kind of quiz question where there was two types of posterior distribution like curves and then they said that okay the true the true ridership on october 22nd was around six thousand something and then all of them were wrong but which one was more wrong right yeah and it was talking about the importance of normalizing, right? So I think this person was trying to create that part where here is the six two 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 riders and then showing how wrong the different models were, you have to use normalization. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a little bit out of order from the book but mm -hmm. 
one thing too that I was a bit confused about was the 50% and the 95% because from how I understood it, it's like your 50% is quite, it's like a shorter margin, your 95% is a wider margin, mm -hmm. but like that makes, like it's, it just makes common sense that, okay, they are 95% will have a lot more things, but in like looking at, won't you want to be more confident, like I want to be 95% confident that um, my ridership is within this a smaller margin. So like, isn't the goal of like Bayesian updating and everything to get your 95% like in a tiny margin or like am I way off or something like that? I guess like my interpretation of it is that it's not so much like we're trying to like fit it in with like in 95%. I think it's just more so like showing here is like the uncertainty in our estimate. I think that's mm -hmm. like for me, at least, like the a really big strength of Bayes compared to frequentist statistics, right? Um, mm -hmm. And like, because like I could compute like any sort of credible interval, right? I want a distribution. I could say like I'm eighty percent confident that like our parameter of interest is between like this and that, or I'm like ninety five percent, or I'm fifty percent, right? It all depends on I think the question that you're answering. Whereas like in like the frequentist like right perspective, like confidence intervals are or not the interpretation of what like I was giving, right? Which is a phase incredible interval. Um, and also a lot of it really comes down to is like, here's just like a point estimate, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't really necessarily get um, the like error, like the error bars right around, around those estimates, right? You just get an estimate and like, maybe it's right. <laughs> you know, assuming, you know, you have all the mm -hmm. other assumptions. So I think that's more so at least what I interpreted it as, not like it, um, not like we're like trying to. Only do 50%. It's just a way of demonstrating like what it looks like. Versus, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I that's kind of what I get. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard to tell sometimes in the book, like why they're doing things, right? They kind of just <laughs> jump into, and that's, that's not, I don't want to like, you know, God forbid, you know, they, they actually see this someday on, on YouTube. It's not, I'm not, I'm not accusing them of anything. We love your book. We love the book. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, it's not, that, it's, it's more of, um, you know, it's like, you know, a lot of times when you're an expert, you, you take leaps that sometimes your audience always can't always gather. So I think it's yeah. more, I think it's more about just showing that like, um, you know, how, how, why like you know this it's pretty i don't know so this isn't in the book right so somebody made this like the, this uh these blue I think this is in the book right is it yeah, is, I don't, yeah. is it okay so they just they just grabbed it um yeah so it's kind of cool right like um um you know these you can see like you know the 50 percent and the and the 95 percent. you kind of get a sense of I mean, obviously, most likely we would, you know, in, in real, in quote unquote, real work, we would use the 95% prediction intervals, right? But just mm -hmm. to show you, like, if you only use 50%, I mean. Um, Your data will. Yeah, like, will suffer, will suffer yeah. accordingly. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, maybe that's, is that, Robert, that's kind of what you said, right? I mean, that's. I yeah. That, yeah. 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 So. I think yeah. it all depends on, like, what it is, like what is the purpose of the analysis? Like, are you sharing it with someone? What do they care about, right? Like, and yeah. what level of uncertainty are they willing to accept, right? Um, I think it's like, mm -hmm. all really just depends. Yeah, and look at, and think about this, like think about, okay, so like, let's say we used only the 50%. Think about all those dots that are outside of those darker blue regions that are just getting, they're, they're you know, like they're, they're not, they're no longer contained, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. within, within those yeah. prediction intervals. And so, and, and obviously when you go outside of the light blue, it's, there's still some stuff there, but it's obviously a heck of a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um maybe it's just kind of showing us that, you know, there's a, there's a price to be paid for, um, you know, uh, 
you know, smaller confidence or smaller prediction intervals. Like once again, like why you'd only want to be 50% confident, uh, uh, like a coin flip that doesn't seem very confident to me. Right. Um, but, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. yeah, anyway, pretty cool. Okay. So I think we talked a little bit about cross validation and the yeah. book goes into how to do cross validation with the, the base package. And it was a pretty straightforward to me until we got to this expected predictive density. And then he, he, he basically also says, that, okay, I introduced it to you, but let's just put it down until chapter 11. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I, I got um, cross validation. And so I don't know if you have any questions comments about cross validation and the elpd elpd um, yeah it says expected log predictive density oh, that's right. was i i didn't really understand it but from what he was saying that like, it's it's okay we don't get it understand it we'll do more because yeah think, as we've been all saying, in terms of what type of question you're trying to answer, it's not everything that will apply to something that is with normal distribution. Maybe it applies to a, a different distribution. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm scrolling through that part of the book again because I, I read this pretty quickly. I didn't think, um, mm -hmm. but um yeah, no, I like the the K-fold um, cross-validation algorithm. I mean, that's kind of like this MAE, this uh, mean um, average uh, error is, um, mm -hmm. is, is you know, we're going to get this for each of the, the K, however many Ks um, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we put in there. Um, um, and so, yeah, if we start seeing like wildly different M8, you know, values where, you know, we might have, um, that might be estimate, you know, that might be evidence that, you know, we, the data that we have just isn't stable enough to sort of, mm -hmm. uh, to detect it. So, um, I'm, yeah, I'm just, uh, see, averaging over this. Okay. So I think split our data. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out did, did, where, what did they, so, there, so the, in this example, they, they, they talk about cross-validation, but they also talk about training and test sets too. Is that right, Robert? I think so. Yeah, this, this one I read a little bit more quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, he, before he goes into cross-validation, he says that first you can do it with like doing training and tests or like use cross-validation to do the like set chop up your data and then yeah. do yeah. the different maes yeah 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 um yeah that's interesting by the way just, just before you know we're, i know we're almost out of time but um I, your your thing has got me all like fired up now i, can't, I keep thinking about <laughs> so my advice would well, be like, like you, now you see where i'm at too i'm like yeah, yeah, okay yeah, i'm yeah. trying to learn base because i i really feel like this yeah. would be a good thing to to do yeah. and yeah <laughs> My only advice would be like, I mean, it's, it seems like, you, I mean, so you don't have a background in doing like Twitter, or like scraping or web scraping, or is that kind of like what you, have you done um, that a bunch? So I'm learning as I go. I, I use the official Twitter API to do this. So mm -hmm. there's some limits because I don't have the academic level because like there's different levels. Sure. And yeah. So scraping and getting that's why my data is only 4500 because it makes you you can only get six days worth of data if you are not at the academic level and on twitter that's that's the case like if you're using the official twitter api to get the data there's a there's a um there's an a there's an ap uh an r package that has an api i bet it's got to be more i bet you can you can all if i find anything is it I'll the put, academic tweets or the r tweets i think r tweets maybe r tweets yeah. yeah 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 i think r tweets was on the because they first had the twitter api that r tweets was using and now this is like the version two and then in the version two there's levels 
So like if you you have to go through some loops, show them like what you're going to do this fall for academic purposes and show them your like your school. Um, like it has to be a little more verified um, with your school stuff. And then hmm. like you can get unlimited access to historical tweets for like ever huh. and ever and ever. Yeah. So that's very cool. So I, I have to work with one of my professors to see how we can get that. So yeah, um, so. Mm -hmm. that's super interesting. I, I got to mm -hmm. jump onto another meeting here in a minute. Sorry. Um, I know we're no, no. kind of so. close to the end, but so I just, before we finish, I'm going to, I'm going to think about some of this. And if I find any cool stuff about scraping on Twitter, cause I used to, I did this a little bit for the marketing team in my last mm -hmm. job. And like, I found some thing that like we could yeah. like, you know, if we, if we, if we, if we yeah. There yeah. are like there's an unofficial way like with Python S N scrape. Have you heard of S N? I've never SN used that. Scrape? Yeah, I've never yeah. really. Yeah, it it is like that one is like generally web scraping, web crawling. So it's not through the Twitter API. Mm. So that one will give you more, but like Twitter is like don't use like it's like illegal to use S <laughs> N. <laughs> yeah i don't know i'll i'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll look into that but uh, that, yeah. that doesn't seem right to me i mean i, I mean it's got to be some i mean and there's, there's so many like twitter sentiment studies out there on a variety yeah. of things i mean like not just i mean i mean what you're using it for is is really great. yeah but there's a million but studies like there's a million on, on that yeah so yeah. but uh, i will be i will uh take the lead next week on um chapter 11 man i can't believe we're already getting semi yeah. close to the end i mean well i mean halfway mm -hmm. it's funny when we when we started this we're like oh the first half chapter like oh god this is gonna be slow and now we've been uh, i feel like we're all yeah. getting it more <laughs> uh, yeah hopefully hopefully yeah so um yeah so it looks like um oh yeah so we're all we're doing is just like we're doing categorical oh. predictors and inter i mean so basically it's just like we're just doing uh, linear regression. I mean, like we're doing re regular regression with just like more fancy predictor structures and stuff like that. Like, um, like um, you know, interaction effects and stuff. So yeah, this will be cool. Yeah, I mean, basically it's just building on kind of what we've done the last two chapters and just, you know, like the, the prediction structures are just a lot more complicated now or they will be now, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. But I, I gotta run. But uh, yeah, this was great, and I'm super. Your your project sounds super cool. So I'm. Uh, I will. Uh, I'm. Gonna, I wrote myself a couple of notes to be on the lookout. And if I, see, I'll drop some things for you, and I'll, I'll in in Slack. And if I find anything, and I'll. I'll sure. I'll, I'll, thank I'll tag you. you. Yeah. So next week, hopefully we have uh, all all everybody back, and um, yeah. mm -hmm. have a good week, y'all, and um, yeah. Good luck. Thank see you. Ya. Have a good bye, week. Ryan. Bye. Yeah, so how would you like to use the next eight minutes to look at some questions or to... Yeah, uh, yeah if you look at some questions, you have any. Um, um, like, we're doing the... Like, actually running the stuff. I'm not... I wasn't following it. Because, you see, I started this from chapter 10, and I've been going back and forth, back and forth. So <laughs> I, I, I missed quite of the middle so oh, <laughs> um yes and then as you said it, it it talks about comparing how fair the model is to like the mcmc approximations yeah yeah well, so, I, so, I, like, I, I guess i just really liked that how at least how it ended right because it's like mm -hmm. there are always like model checks where, where again like did this model like run correctly, right? In terms of like just the model. And then it's like, mm -hmm. okay, does your model like suck in the terms of like, <laughs> am I predicting what I what I think mm -hmm. I'm predicting, right? Um, which yeah. I, I think is good because um, even like some of what I was doing at work, I was like, wait, that posterior does not look right. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that I was like, yeah. here's predictions. I'm like, no, oh, no, I'm not just, I'm doing something wonky with the priors. Mm -hmm. um uh, even like just this morning when i was working on this so i was like okay mm -hmm. good it, and, and and like but my chains were good right and if mm -hmm. you just stopped mm -hmm. there that would be like bad um obviously yeah yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so do you normally have to so there's two things that we learned that you have to do this part where like 
giving your posterior distribution, go back and get this, like compare, like, do you always do that? Like for your um, model? I honestly, again, like I, I think all the, the base stuff is literally only because we started this thing like months ago, this book club, right? So like, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm like still super, super fresh. I just find it like very interesting for me, a person who's like mm -hmm. really struggle a lot more with like math and stats. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. this is actually like, I get this, like more like, you know, getting this, <laughs> yeah. right? I'm actually understanding mm -hmm. it. I'm not like feeling like dumb or like, I can't do this. Um, mm -hmm. But to your question about that, I actually hadn't. And I was going to be doing that today because mm -hmm. after I read this chapter, I'm like, no oh, way. <laughs> this would also be like a good way to, to like show to stakeholders. Like just, I think it's like just another level of just like, this is how we're like communicating results, right? It's not just a point estimate. Like I can show you the posterior, here's the plausible values. Here's some, like, if we wanted to like sample, right? Some like data from this posterior and do some predictions. Does it look like the date, the sample of data we are working with? And I think it's all just about like mm -hmm. giving, I think even Ryan said this is like, you're never really going to get like a correct answer, right? But you're going to get to a, you're going to add more evidence to your case, right? It's like, I, I, I went through all this like modeling work and it's like, here is what it is. Here is my uncertainty. Here's like, yeah. it's not totally awful, as you see. Like, you know, mm -hmm, <laughs> here, mm -hmm. here, here are these plots. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wouldn't say yeah. that to a stakeholder. Be like, look, look, plot. <laughs> um, but yeah. um, I, I think that's I, I, I really hadn't. And as soon as I read this chapter last night, I'm like, oh, that's actually something I should do. <laughs> Just mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. and, I, and I did it for one of them. I'm like, oh, but actually, okay. Go, yeah, Robert. Yeah. You're not. You're not totally stupid at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going back to like the very the chapter you presented, was it on the chapter nine? Yes. Okay. Wait. Because no, remember, was it? No, no. It was chapter eight. Mine was chapter eight. Ron. Yours was presented, chapter eight. Yeah, mine okay. was chapter eight. Ron presented. Uh, when you chapter nine. when you did chapter eight. Did we do this posterior prediction thing? Because we did some posterior something, something. I, I don't yeah, know. no, we did actually. Um, we did do some posterior prediction, right? I think it was, um, I want to say it was all of the model parameters. And you're like, oh, here's like, if you were to predict like the next 20 samples, I think it was in the um, Museum okay. of Modern Art. Um, so is, was that similar to this in a way or? Yeah, I, I, I think at least my interpretation with this is that it's showing, again, like, right, I, it's something, I, I think I've said this a bunch, but like, what we are fundamentally predicting in Bayes are the possible values a parameter in a distribution can take, right? Like, for, like, the binomial, right? The binomial has two parameters, right? N, number of samples, and pi, mm -hmm. the probability of success on a trial, right? And obviously that's like some assumptions, like mm -hmm. uh, we assume that all trials are like independent and we assume the probability uh, pi is constant, right? Uh, for each of those trials. Um, so like when we, you know, do MCMC what, and like on like pi, right? Um, we get like a whole range of plausible values um, for that. So, mm -hmm. Um, like, at, like, you know, maybe, maybe you say like pi, like your posterior is between like 0.1 and 0.3, right? And so maybe the most likely value is 0.2, just assuming, mm -hmm. right? Um, you could just use the most likely value, or since these are all like plausible values, you can kind of do what we're doing in this chapter is like, uh, with the light blue is showing like, here are the possible shapes right of these like distributions for this like uh this target of interest right in this case right we're looking at ridership so like in in this we're estimating uh the intercept you know the slope all that good stuff and then we're uh essentially saying like okay here is like we, we're gonna plug those in and this is what we think the distribution for ridership looks like um mm -hmm. Like given given the for all these like different plausible parameters that we uh, sampled from, um, so that's at least mm -hmm. I think it's just like to me is more like a step up where like 
we have all these samples, but like, let's actually show like some plausible distributions. Obviously you can't plot all like 20,000 of them, yeah. um, but we can yeah. like, you know, like randomly sample like 50, which I think is what the book mm -hmm. does. Um, and then show like, hey, yeah, this is like, maybe you end up going with like the median estimate, right? For those parameters uh, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, but you can also show uh, that that is not the only thing we estimated. We estimated actually a whole universe of plausible uh, yeah. parameters, mm -hmm. right? And like, then we can show that graphically. And that gives, I think, both you more confidence that you're doing it like more or less right. And also anyone you're trying to like present it to uh, gives them more understanding about like what it is you're doing. And also like, okay, yeah, they gave me an estimate, but this estimate can reasonably range from like these bounds. These values, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to try and do tonight, try and relate this, what we did with the chapter eight, because it's all like mixed in my head, posterior, posterior. Does it say <laughs> posterior inference and prediction? And yep. this is posterior predictive check. So yep. like what, these two. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Of course. Um, yeah, this was great. Um, best mm -hmm. of luck on your project. Sounds honestly really <laughs> fun. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think it's, those are like the fun projects where it's like, A, you're like doing something of value, right? Mm -hmm. um, from like, I think like a normative standpoint and B, it's like, it's cool in the sense that you're unsure of where to start with. But like, I yeah. think that's also yeah. like kind of fun too. Because like, once you figure it out, you're like, Oh, I can, I'll write this shit up, you know, like, yeah, excuse yeah. my French, but, uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, this was very good. Yeah. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. You too, Alma. Bye. Bye.